Got it. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bethany Hanfield. I'm the administrator here at the Penticton and District Community Arts Council. I want to thank everybody for joining us today for Michael's Artist Talk for mythologizing the mundane. We're really excited to have Michael Demang here in our gallery and also for our online exhibition. And I just want to take a, a moment to acknowledge the beautiful land that we live on. It's the unceded uh, territory of the Silk Okanagan people who've been here for thousands of years. And we're very grateful to live, work, and play uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, so thank you for coming. And thank you for Michael for being a part of this exhibition. I've been a longtime fan. And I'm so excited to have his work here. Uh, we had a Boxzilla workshop here, which was really awesome. And now we're having this super cool artist talk with friends from around the world. So we're really happy that everybody could join us. And if you're not familiar with Michael Demang, well, let me tell you, he is an acclaimed international artist. He's also uh, an author. He teaches around the world. He has a podcast, Strange Tales of Myth and Magic. And he also has an amazing line of uh, online workshops, which have an amazing fellowship attached to them, many of which the folks are here today. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Michael. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. And by the way, just for clarification, um, I'm not exhibiting in the gallery myself. I mean, my art is, but just in case you were looking to see me personally um, as a statuary, I am not I'm not actually there just to be clear. So um, but yeah, so today I'm going to give a little talk about the um, about the exhibit, and a lot of stuff that's not in the exhibit before I do before I do that, I do want to do my acknowledgments uh, as well. And just want to acknowledge that this artist talk is taking place on the traditional and ancestral unceded territory of Coquitlam, the Coquitlam First Nation. Um, we thank the Coquitlam who continue to live on these lands and care for them, along with the waters and with the waters and all that is above and below. So with no further ado, let's get cracking. So cracking, that's a good topic. Um, that like releasing the Kraken. Of course, I haven't, I, I have, uh, I have um, done Krakens um, artistically, but um, I, a few here and there, but let, let's, let's talk a little bit. I thought we, we'd start with this talk by going backwards in time. And um, to do that, um, I wanted to talk, because one of the questions I get, especially when we talk about the idea of mythologizing the mundane, and I suppose I should explain what that is first. So the idea of mythologizing the mundane is a catchy term I came up with a couple of years back um, because I like the idea of taking everyday things and transforming them into something that's a little bit, um, you know, a, a little bit more uh, intriguing. You know, you, you find an old tea kettle, Okay, well, it, it's, its life is past, but how can you reinvent that life? How can you change it to give it a new life, a new existence? You know, it's really sort of the process of, of um, you know, sort of the phoenix. You know, you go through this process and it, something is reborn. In this case, it's not reborn as the same thing, but something dramatically different. Um, and to me, that's intriguing because it, it's, I, I think we all can sort of relate to the idea of like, you know, you go through your life and um, and he's like, oh, this is this is what I am. This is what I am. But sometimes things happen in your life that make make you go in really exciting, exciting places. You know, it and it allows suddenly something happens, and what you were is no longer the same. And that could be a small event, could be a large event. And so, in many ways, I, I view these artistic creations as that. Because when I transform a shoe, that shoe, if it had consciousness, which I, I doubt it does, but maybe it does. Um, but if that shoe had consciousness, how great to suddenly say, whoa, this is not the life I was expecting. This is a much more interesting life than I was, I was figured I was going to end up in a trash can. And so the idea of transforming something and giving it a really unexpected life is, is really pretty exciting to me. So with no further ado, let's go back in time. All right. So of course, I've got to pull up, pull up this. You guys can see that okay? Nod your heads. So, okay, so um, you recognize him, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, this is from a Ray Harryhausen film. This is the, this is the, uh, this is the Cyclops in um, one of the Sinbad movies. I believe it's the golden voyage of Sinbad. Um, but 
Um, this was an early inspiration to me in terms of getting excited about the concept of mythology, because one of the things that um, I think uh, really made my art what it is today is this interest in mythology. And of course, things like Ray Harryhausen's movies like this one, or Jason and the Argonauts, you know, of course, there's the giant uh, the giant bronze dude who's ready to step on people. And of course, the very famous, the very famous skeleton fighting scene, um, which I will say, just as an aside, this is one of the most amazing stop animation scenes. And I've decided a long time ago that skeletons are the perfect thing for stop animation because they sort of move, they should be moving kind of like stop animation. So you don't see the weird sort of jittery thing because they're jittery al already. So. Um, now, I want to go to the uh, World Book Encyclopedia, the Golden Book Encyclopedia, excuse me. This is the beginning of my mythological journey. And um, it is actually, it is actually this particular book, book number five, Daguerreotypes to, ep to uh, Epiphytes. Okay, I don't even know what that is. Anyway, um, so this was, the, this was the book that started it all. And it started because on, I, I went to this page and this happened, I don't know, I might've been in second or third grade, perhaps maybe a little older, but it was the days of the week. And I was scrolling through it. And I was all of a sudden, here's this entry, days of the week. And I see all these weirdly clad dudes that are reminiscent to some of the Sinbad movies and Jason the Argonaut movies. And I'm like, wait a second, These, you, I, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, oh, Thor, Thor is for Thursday. And, and, and then it's like Frigg is for Friday. And who are these people? And then I started going, oh, cool. Days of the week are named after myth mythological people. And I go, well, what really are mythological people? And down here it says, see Greek myths, see Norse gods and goddesses. And so of course it led me down this crazy rabbit hole of like, here's another entry under the myths and legends section that said, here's all these, all these different mythologies and here's all these different things. And I started getting intrigued by these concepts of, of myths and legends. And that really, that really was the thing that, that got me rolling. Believe it or not, it is, it is, it is this book that actually um, started the whole thing. I mean, Ray Harryhausen movie, but it started me on an, sort of an intellectual journey into trying to, to take in as much of this stuff as I could. Now, we're gonna go back to share screen again because I wanna show you the, um, there we go. Oops, get rid of that. Okay, so let's, let's go to the next thing that really made my, um, made my heart pitter pat. Um, and that was a trip to Mexico. And, um, show you a couple little little nichos here. Um, now I could not find the original the original one I bought but back when back when I was uh, oh I, fresh out of college I decided to, to make take a trip to Oaxaca Mexico. And in Oaxaca Mexico, um, I was there of course for Dia de los Muertos um, Day of the Dead. And you know I was wandering around the city of Oaxaca. Um, and of course the cemeteries and I, and for those of you who don't know, and I, I assume most of you know, but just in case, um, Dia de los Muertos is, takes place on, it's these days, it's actually a several day celebration. Um, primarily it's November 1st and November 2nd. Um, but it is basically a day where you go to the cemeteries, you decorate the graves. Um, this is an actual grave from one of the cemeteries in Oaxaca. Um, you um, line them with candles. There's incense to help lead the spirits, uh, the ancestors to the to the place they are buried. And basically, the the relatives hang out there all night long and and um, basically reminisce and drink and and sing with with their their ancestors. Um, and so that is I. I went there and I was you know looking at all these you know graves and flowers and how beautiful it was, and I was just amazed at just how things were transformed there. So one of the things I came across was something similar to this in, in like a little gallery. 
except the version that I saw in a gallery was a little sardine can. Um, and it had a little devil. And in the background, there was a little, oh, like a little magazine cut out of the, like the tree of life. And um, there was a little, a little collage element of Adam and Eve, you know, hanging out there exchanging the apple. And then in front, the little clay devil, similar to this, was kind of sitting around and he had a bucket of apples um, for, I think it was 10 pesos for an apple, you know, and I thought, oh, that's cool. But, but more than that, what I thought was interesting was how I started seeing in Mexican art, how stuff was used and reused and transformed. Um, you know, sardine can, even to the point, and this is, um, this is a little tree that's not far from the hotel that my class stays at. And there's a, this, this park has little knots in it, and it's filled with all these little Guadalupe um, images throughout the, you know, you look around, it's not a very big park, but a lot of the knots have little Guadalupes painted. And one of the things that I was fascinated by was that Mexican culture seems to, maybe because it's, you know, has less money to be sure, um, but it just seemed to me that they didn't have as much money, so therefore they reuse things. And they reuse things not just for utilitarian purposes, but because um, they could also make art out of it. Now, when I was fresh out of, when I was fresh out of art school, um, that idea of using whatever happens to be laying around, this is an earlier piece, by the way, in case you were wondering, um, whatever happens to be laying around um, is a lot cheaper than buying canvas and stretcher bars and all that other stuff. So I started looking at the idea of taking things and um, and say, okay, well, I can, you know, I can, I can take stuff. Sorry, the quality of the photos. These, I know these are these are well traveled photos, um, but I can take these things and and these will be my canvas. You know, I can take these old frames, I can take these collage things, and then, then I don't have to spend as much money um, trying to, trying to uh, create something from nothing. And I think I've got one more oldie here. But um, those, of you, you might, those of you who are familiar with me, are, you, might, you might be familiar with a dramatic change in color scheme over the years. These, uh, these early pieces, it's funny for me to even look at because, you know, it's like, wow, you know, I was pretty bare bones with color. Um, back in the olden days. So um, so anyway, the Mexico trip was definitely um, the thing that, that got me rolling. Um, and I would say that um, it, it, it led me to the idea that, you know, art can be like the experience of going to, you know, to Mexico for Day of the Dead in that it's the idea of nothing ever really ends. Um, and I think that's true regardless of, of whatever your belief system is. You know, nothing ever really ends. You could be an atheist and that can be accurate. Um, it just continues in different ways. And I think that the, the relationship to me in Mexico um, and creating art is, is just that. Now, this is not a traditional piece of art that I would, that I wouldn't put this in a gallery. This is where I, I, I sort of store my brushes or did anyway. I think I used that lower face for something, which is sort of the cannibalistic nature of my work, by the way. So something hangs around too long in my studio. It's doomed or I, I don't know, doomed the right word. It depends on, I, I suppose, the, the piece's uh, attitude. Um, if I if I create a if I create a, a piece of art and nothing happens with it, and I'm not a hundred percent with it, um, there is the risk that it will get swallowed up in another piece of art. Now, by the way, this is a photo of a number of pieces in my in my studio that many of which are no longer there. Um, some of which are actually in Penticton. And if you haven't seen the exhibit, I know that you know trying to get there is difficult um, in some cases these days. Um, of course, if you're in BC, it's a lot easier. But um, do take a look at the online exhibit because you can see all the artwork up there. And of course you can purchase and, and Bethany has stickers for sale, which is cool. I don't think I've ever had stickers before. Thanks for that, Bethany. They're actually behind her. They're not that big though. If you look at her screen, you can see all the stickers behind her. Um, so this is a lot of the work. Ooh, that's a small photo. This is a lot of the work that, that is actually at the exhibit. Now I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go through some of this artwork and I'm gonna sort of progress um, sort of time-wise. So we'll take a look at another old piece. And one of the fun things 
um, about this process, I think, is the, um, the idea of going through, like for the viewer to go through and see if they can recognize what these, what these items are. So, so of course, you know, this was a, started as an old frame and there's a, you know, a, a mannequin hand and all that stuff. But of course there's, you know, no piece of art is, is complete without having a backrest, you know, from a, like a taxi cab. Um, like there is in the upper corner there, um, which is funny. That was actually the last thing that went on there or close to the last thing. Um, and because the piece was, I thought was kind of boring. I was like, yeah, this is really kind of boring. Da, 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 da. And I just had that laying around the studio. Now why I had it in the studio, I'm not sure, but it, um, it, you know, it, it were, I liked it. I just sort of made it less, you know, less, less uh, um, symmetrical and get a little more intrigue. So yeah, not, anything, anything is possible. Um, I think these next few slides are from a series I did called Strange Angels. Um, and uh, this is a fairly large piece, um, probably about, oh, I'd say about three or, well, probably three or four feet high, I'd say. Um, started with an anatomy man, one of those large see-through guys, the big ones. Um, and this is St. Michael, and St. Michael's the guy who basically keeps the devil down in the hole. Um, he's in charge of, uh, he's the guy who keeps, you know, the, the devil down and keeps him from sneaking up. And so, which is actually, by the way, uh, an image you see a lot of in Mexico, um, the idea of St. Michael. Um, and usually you'll see a snake or a dragon down below in a lot of the, in a lot of uh, um, religious art. And so this is St. Michael. Um, I'm not sure why he's a cyclops, other than my my affinity to cyclopean um, cyclopean characters. So you're, you'll see a lot of that just just because just because. All right, and this is a this is another strange angel. I cannot remember this particular angel though. I had a whole list of them, and I was looking through my notes, and I could not find um, who this angel was. Um, I remember it was the name anyway. It was an angel of secrets. And I'd have to do more research to find the name again. It was amazing because when I was doing this series, um, there were I don't know, thousands of different angels from various religions, not all of them, you know, Christianity and Judaism and, you know, and Islam, but it was amazing how many, how many different angels there were. Um, but this is a, this is a secret keeper um, angel. And um, this is Rahab who is, um, a angel um, from Islamic tradition, who is kind of like the uh, raiser of the souls, you know, souls are, are reborn, and thus that's what, that's what this one is. You can see, of course, this, this uh, also started, I had a whole bunch of anatomy men back there. So this also started from an anatomy man. And, um, and one of the things that you guys probably notice is that, and we're gonna get a little more in depth with this as we move on, but the use of paint with these things to really take these objects into a different, into a different realm. Here's, a, here's another earlier shrine. Um, I, I, I would say I was doing a lot more collage back then too. Um, this one is also a version of uh, keeping the devil down in the hole. I'm not sure why I need to keep the devils down in the hole as much as I do, but um, perhaps that's what my art is doing for me. It's, it's helping keep my devils at bay, I suppose. Um, at one point or another, I decided to start creating weirdo characters, um, and this was uh, this was one of the weirdo one of my first weirdo characters, um, made of course from a brush and a dolly, and um, a rubber snake and a dinosaur and all things that that really you know you know sort of like in the Sesame Street thing one of these things is not like the other. Well, in this case, all of these things are not like the other, um, yet. My goal, of course, is to try and make them feel like they're part of the same thing. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's one of those really cool brushes, you know, those big honking ones. I think they're, you know, the, uh, I think they're for like, um, shoot, plaster or wallpaper, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, here's another, not a creature, but another strange angel. This one, an angel of knowledge. Once again, Cyclopean. But you know, the, the truth of it though, is that one of the reasons, all right, just on a pragmatic level, the advantage of doing Cyclopses 
is you only need one eye. So if you have, if, you know, eyes are kind of precious. So in this case, it's not, it's an actually collaged eye, but um, you know, when you've got, you know, when you, I don't have to find another eye. I only have one eye that I have to worry about. And then I can make two creatures instead of one, right? So that is the advantage. Here's another creature. This is um, my little, my, my little Krishna dude. Um, interesting thing is that um, this does roll as you, as you might hope. But one of the, the cool things was, is I had the hand in the back, which sort of waves it. Um, it originally it spun around, but glue got stuck in the, the gizmo. And so now when you, um, when you um, pull it back, it springs back. So it actually worked out best. And I believe if you visit Jesse Reno in his, uh, in his studio, you can see this because Jesse Reno has this hang around his place. He's kind of a skateboard guy. So it makes sense that Jesse would have it. Well, here's sort of a Kraken piece for you. Um, and um, this all started with, I, I know that you guys are all muted, but see if you can guess what the main form is. Um, and I'll give you ding, 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 ding. Um, I'm reading people's lips. Yes. I said, oh, look at the hand. I see, I got, I got all the hand gestures. See, that's good. Yes, yeah, so a Bellows. This is Bellows, not Dr. Bellows from I Dream of Genie, for those of you who remember that show. But um, this, is a, this is a Bellows. And um, I had the, the bummer was I had to dissect a fair amount of it um, to make it sort of sit flat. So, but I, I don't, I, I don't entirely know how this came about or with this even means, because actually with a lot of my work, the meaning will, will sort of come out of it. So um, when I'm working on a piece, often what happens is in this case, you know, I started with the bellows. And then for some reason, it, I, I had all those little finger, you know, the little finger tentacle things that you get in the novelty stores. And I had those laying around. And so I go, you know, that would make sort of a nice frame-ish element. And then of course, you know, the rest follow. And then the story comes from it. Now, sometimes I'll have a story in mind. Um, sometimes less, that's less the case. So, um, you know, this one became sort of a general Kraken sort of concept, nothing, nothing particular, but a lot of times the, the piece is built or being in the process being built and the story grows from it. Um, and a good example of that might be Lilith. Um, so this was a piece that I really, Lilith, okay, so those of you who don't know Lilith, Lilith is um, Adam's first girlfriend or wife actually. Um, so those the in uh, in Judaic in Judaic lore, um, Adam was um, had a first wife. She was made. She was an equal. She was made not of Ad, not from Adam, but made of the same material that Adam was. So they were equals. Um, and she was very opinionated, and she she wanted you know she wanted her she wanted uh, you know an equal say in what was going down and. And uh, Adam wasn't really down with that. And he was kind of a kind of a whiny baby. You know, well, la, 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 I don't really like her. He started complaining to God, like he doesn't listen to anything. And and finally, Lilith said, "Screw you, buddy. I'm out of here. I don't want don't want your crap anymore." And she sprouts wings and flies off to the Red Sea, where she has, I think it's like a thousand thousand babies a day with like some demons there. And anyway, so um, she's she's a demon. Now, she's also sort of a, these days, she's also viewed slightly differently than she would have been viewed um, in ancient lore, right? So she's, you know, um, sort of an icon of feminism um, these days. And she uh, she's really a, she's really an intriguing character. So anyway, she she has all these little demon babies. These these are little I call them sucky babies. Um, uh, and so they can come out. But um, to get back to the point of what I was talking about, here's a better photo of it or a closer photo of it. But these, this box is really kind of the, the starting point. I had no idea what I was going to do um, with this box. So this box is a really long box. This sucker is probably about four feet long. And I bought it in a secondhand shop in North Carolina. And basically there's a lid. And so the lid 
is here you can and so and then there's an opening so you can see the little slots inside now of course the slots did not have little succubus babies um, in them when I bought it um, and I at first I didn't know what it was so I asked the the per, the person who um, who I was buying it from at this big antique mall in 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 Asheville North Carolina and they go oh it's a dynamite mold you would store your dynamite in it so each of these little slots would have dynamite in it and of course in hindsight i you know i was thinking like i you know i how do i i i don't know that i would be able to if i was living in canada i don't know that the dynamite residue would have been out of it i suspect that the customs and immigration might have, have pounced on me but at the time i was living in the state so you know that you know got shipped okay but anyway, I had this big thing and I had no idea what to do other than I know I wanted to put stuff in it. And so for one reason or another, Lilith evolved and the idea of having a bunch of little sucky babies that you could come out and do devilish things and then go back in um, to um, hang out with their, their mumsy. So this is actually, um, this is actually a piece that um, came about from my first trip to um, Vancouver, um, long before I lived um, in this area. Um, I was uh, teaching um, in, in, you know, in uh, Vancouver and I was staying, at the time I was staying downtown and um, I was trying to find a secondhand shop, uh, Baker's Dozen, which has subsequently closed and moved. They're now reopened, thank goodness. But a really cool secondhand shop um, antique shop in Vancouver, and I was trying to find it, and I was going through an area called Hastings in Maine, and Hastings, Maine has a lot of, a lot, a lot of homeless um, folks lying around and, and hanging out, and it, it's, you know, it, it's uh, a lot of the, the uh, missions and things are in that area, and a pretty, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty much a bummer. It's really sad to go through that, that intersection for sure. And there, at the time, I think it's been filled in by now, but there was a lot that was just vacant, um, a lot of rubble, and it was sort of chain linked fenced um, around. Um, and, you know, the, there's grass growing in the middle of it, you a lot of trash in this empty lot. Um, and as I was driving around, there was this young woman, I'm guessing, oh, probably late teens, early 20s, and kind of, kind of punkish dressed. And she's standing in the middle of the lot on a mound of rubble, um, doing like dancing just all by herself, the only person inside this lot doing this little, little pirouette. And it reminded me of um, the um, composition Death and the Maiden. And um, so, you know, just how this, you know, very beautiful thing surrounded, you know, by, you know, despair. And so that's what, that's what this piece um, symbolized to me. And just, and of course you can see her in the, the mouth of death right there. So, well, it is, it is Halloween month. This is Frankenstein, um, monster anyway, not Baron von Frankenstein, but this is Frankenstein's monster. Um, I, I, suppose, I, I suppose Frankenstein was trying to save on eyes too, because he made Frankenstein a Cyclops as well. Um, you know, where he found such large eyes, I don't know, but um, you grave rob, you find lots of things. Um, so this is, um, I, I should mention that shrines, shrines are such an uh, integral part of what I do. Even when something isn't a shrine, there's a shrinish nature about what I do. Um, most of my work is typically very symmetrical. And a lot of that comes from the, comes from the Mexican influence, um, the Latin American influence um, that you know, from going to Oaxaca and Mexico City or wherever I go to. Um, but um, this, is, um, this is actually sort of a, a ghost tale, um, loosely based on La Llorona, um, but not directly. This is more of a, this is um, more of a ghost story. Um, La Llorona is the weeping woman in Mexico who is, uh, wanders the waterways. Um, um, don't go down by the water, La Llorona will get your kids type of thing. Um, but not entirely based on that, but it is sort of a, it is sort of a ghosty woman. This was, um, this was made for, uh, for um, a workshop I did in New Orleans. The, um, and it, of course, New Orleans, of course, is filled with ghosty women and ghosts in general. So 
Um, this is my little ghosty woman lurking inside her little musical, musical um, home. And of course, here's a little Napoleon. Um, I'm not sure what's so special about him other than I thought I would point out that um, the um, many of the eyes that you might see, and his eyes are bulgy, um, many of the eyes that you might see actually come from Mexico, because um, that is one of the questions that I get asked a lot, is where do you get your eyes from? And, um, and they usually come from religious stores in Mexico, um, where I buy all different sizes of them, um, because, you're, you know, when you, have a, when you have a saint in a church and its eyes pop out, you got to replace it. So, um, you know, unless you're, I'm trying to remember the female saint with the eyes on the platter, in which case you wouldn't need the eyes, but, um, but uh, Santa, let's see, Santa Lucia, I can't remember, anyway. Um, but these, uh, these eyes all come from Mexico, though, unfortunately, I got a photograph recently from a friend of mine who was in Oaxaca, and she photographed a religious store um, there, and unfortunately, um, it is so bare bones, I don't think anybody is going to find eyes on this trip. So um, COVID has taken all my eyes away from me. It's a sad thing. Now, some of you guys might remember some of these guys. Um, I thought I'd throw a few robots in here. Um, and I think, the, uh, I, I think the thing with these robots were, were for a workshop I did. Um, recently, not that I haven't done robots, but it really actually, one of the things about doing online classes, it, it often will force me into different directions I don't typically do. So though I had make, made found object machiney creatures, honestly, I don't know that I, I ever really made robots prior to um, the online class I did. And it, it really was kind of a fun adventure for me. And I, I believe a lot of the students had a lot of fun doing it as well. But the idea of trying to um, make things intentionally look like like weirdo machines, um, and yet and yet um, try and give them a sense of personality. Um, and robots are a little bit different than when you're using things like collage and baby doll parts in terms of that, because you have sort of built-in personality. So a lot of times when you're doing robot-y things, it um, has to do with gesture, but but also. Um, a level of, uh, like in this case, it's sort of like the, they're create. There's a story suddenly. It's like, oh, okay. There's a brain in a dome. Okay, so that creates a different sort of narrative to it. Um, so robots were were really kind of an adventure for me in terms of like, it, it's almost like a free for all, because if you think of sort of like a steampunky robot, you really could have literally anything um, as long as you have gizmos and gears and justify it. You know, it's like, well, of course he's going to have a brain and a little antenna on his head. And of course it's going to be an old, um, old motorcycle. You know, it's just, you know, some guy like, oh, and I'll add this to it. Oh, and I'll throw this onto it. And which was really kind of the, the process I was, I, was, uh, I was going for. So um, about uh, three or four years ago, I started playing with um, um, animals uh, as a topic. Um, and this, I think this was really the start of it. Um, this was, um, this is my version of the white rabbit. Um, and um, of course it's a, it's a humanoid, a humanoid hybrid um, of the white rabbit. And um, down below, that's where you put your, that's where the, the little Alice in Wonderland book goes. So you can have your white rabbit, pull out your book and, and read from it. You know, it might be some nightly ritual, which actually it's interesting because um, this piece sold to a friend of mine in LA who is, uh, she, she just out of chance, um, she started finding rabbits in her yard and then she started rehabilitating them because they would get diseases. And now I don't even know how many rabbits she has that she cares for. Um, so she wanted this piece and I go, okay, well, I have a book that, you know, that will, you know, that will fit in there, you know, and all that. So, oh, no, don't worry about it. I have the perfect book that will go in there. So she already had Alice in Wonderland that was, so she has her own Alice in Wonderland book that goes in there. Um, now, this is, um, this is off, off that piece, I started doing a series of sort of um, mounts. Um, and this was based on um, Durer's woodcut or 
print uh, that was uh, of like a rhinoceros. Now Durer was what I'm trying to think, 1600s, 1500s, something like that. But he did these amazing, these amazing prints. Um, and of course, in Europe, they didn't really know what a rhinoceros looked like. They just kind of had, you know, sort of word of mouth and some rough sketches. Um, and so he had, he had created a, a rhino that was just armored like a, you know, like a knight practically in the, in the, uh, in his print. And so I decided I would do sort of a physical version of that. Um, and this started with a rhino, like a really pretty bare bones, like, I think it was like a, a cast iron rhino head that was somewhat realistic. But then of course I, I had to add all the little gizmos and gears to it and then give it, you know, give it a mount. Um, along the same vein, um, I did the same thing with a giraffe. Um, and, um, and of course, <laughs> um, you never know where parts that you take apart come in handy, but this, this, um, this beast's uh, mount is actually from a bellows that I dissected. So, you know, once again, not the same bellows I, I was using earlier, but um, a bellows that, um, uh, that I use part of it in something else. So there's always something that you can use that will, will come in handy. And of course, I, I don't know what significance it I, ha I had for it other than it looked really cool. I had a, an Italian um, Milagro, um, which is on the forehead. You can sort of see, um, you know, the, the Italian Milagro, which everybody, would, <laughs> I remember showing people this like, why didn't you make a cast of that? I go, I just want to use the original. Just leave me alone. I want to use the original. And of course, it'd be a lot cheaper if I, if I made, did cast of things. But for me, I very seldom do that. I, I do like to use the original stuff. And yeah, it's more expensive. And I, I don't know, I think that was a $100 Milagro or something. But anyway, that's what you do. That's the stuff you do. And I think I got one more of these. There's the Nemean lion. Um, this piece was made almost directly after getting back from Florence um, in large, very large scale, um, probably about three feet high, I'd guess, if not more. Um, but if, um, if, you've been to, um, if you've been to Florence and you go to the, um, what is it, the de' Medici, I think it's the de' Medici's um, uh, castle or whatever you want to call it. Um, they have all these big lions, big lion faces surrounding the exterior. And I was very smitten with them. I was mesmerized by these lions. And um, I did include something that I did buy in Florence. Down on the way, way bottom, there's a little circular thing. And that was some weird little piece of uh, like metal uh, like metal filigree or something, not filigree, but a little metal um, decorative thing that I, I have no idea where it went on, but it's just this little round thing. Um, you can't really see it very well, but it's, um, we bought a bunch of them in a flea market down there. And so of course that, that made it into the piece. And um, these little, these little almost like feather things coming off the main, um, those are actually the little, um, little wood, oh, what are they called? The little, the, they're these little, uh, tear shaped uh, wood things. I think they're sort of um, like, I think they're like shims. I can't remember what, or shoot, I'm drawing a blank as to what they're used for, but they basically are little, little um, oval shim thing type things that you get in the hardware store. And I had a bunch of them. So as you can see, a lot of my, a lot of my building skills don't come from traditional carpentry. I made it up as I went along. So of course, puppet theaters are always kind of fun. Um, this was these, uh, I started doing a bunch of little, um, sometimes, you know, when you do work on a big piece, it can be very overwhelming and exhausting. So um, I found that it, I often will offset working big and working small. So I started doing these strange little characters. Some of these are actually in um, Penticton right now. And um, excuse me, they, you know, they were just nice because you could just say, oh, here's a razor blade. I'm going to make a little creature out of that. And here's a little light bulb. I'm going to do that. And the little bunny rabbit guy, that's actually, his head is actually um, an upside down torso. So the two little, two little points on his ears are actually the legs of a, a little dolly. So, but um, it's just kind of a fun little way to, to um, you know, if you can't think of anything good to do, 
uh, it's kind of fun to work small because then you can not that not, not that they don't not these small things don't cause their own grief but at least starting them i find to be a little bit um a little bit relaxing um and of course some more puppet theaters now these puppet guys eventually led to um a much bigger project um where i decided uh to do the entire um, major arcana of the tarot deck. Um, and I, I really, really wanted to keep them all together, but I know that nobody would have bought the whole set. It would have been a jillion dollar set. Um, so I decided to sell them off, which is, which was fine. It's just, you know, you, you're also like, ah, but would have been nice to see them all together and all that stuff. But this is actually the tower. So those of you who are familiar with tarot, tar the tower is the, often sort of symbolically the, the fall of, uh, you know, from grace, like fall of Garden Eden, but usually it's a tower and has a, um, has a male, female falling from the tower. It usually is like one of the, one of the most distressing cards in the deck um, um, because it means big transformation and not necessarily easy transformation. So if you look closely um, down below, way down on the, the ground between the legs, are um, sort of Adam and Eve-ish characters with their suitcases packed, um, being expelled from someplace. But I, I decided to make the tower into so, sort of like a Baba Yaga house um, in this case. So here's the here's the uh, the whole group, the whole major arcana. At least I think it's the whole group um, that I did, and you know the devils in the front. Um, but yeah, this was the, the whole group. One of my favorite pieces, and I should have tried to find a, a different photo of it um, before this, but um, is over, over on the uh, left of the screen on the bottom is the hanged man, which has got the little hand head um, on there hanging upside down in his sort of spider, spider woven nest. But this was fun because, you know, it, this, this was an interesting project because I, this is one of those things where I was mentioning earlier, I would, you know, I, a lot of times I would work on something and I would um, just kind of go with the flow and say, oh, let's see where this goes. This was different. I worked on this in order. And so when I started, um, I started with the center screen. In the center of the screen, there's a dude with sort of a big long nose and a little orange uh, cape or whatever you want to call it. That's the fool. So I started in order of appearance um, from him to the end. And so I knew that I had, when I was making each one, I'd say, okay, I've got to do this. Now I'm doing the empress, which is just over his shoulder. There's the empress um, or right behind him is the high priest or excuse me, the, the hermit who's got his little light bulb. Um, and so I, I knew that I had these things to do. And so it was a challenge because how do you, you know, you know, I don't, if you've ever messed with tarot, like I know a lot of people have tried to make tarot things. It's really challenging to, to evoke what the card represents. And um, how do I say that? What's the best way to, to do that? And um, so it was a very challenging project. It was, it was, I was really glad I did it, but it was a lot of work. Um, I could not imagine doing the entire 72, 72 cards, 72 cards, I think. Um, that would have been, that would have been crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, the major arcana uh, was definitely um, challenge enough. So, oh, here's another puppet theater. This is, uh, can't really see this one too well. This is Richard III, those Shakespeare buffs. Richard III is the little hunchback guy to the right. Um, and Chamberlain, his nasty sidekick is to the left. And um, by the way, her dress in the front, um, that's a little um, badminton birdie thing, in case you were wondering. And let's go to Wizard of Oz. I only had a few photos of this handy. So this is the scarecrow. Um, and he really wished he had a brain, which is why he has all these science-y equations on the back, which by the way, um, if you're a sciencey person, those equations mean absolutely nothing. Um, so, so those of you who are like, oh, I am going to have to figure out what it is he's writing. It is entirely random. Um, so um, I, I should have I, I should have just left it because you know somebody out there, you know, oh, oh, I know what he's saying with the I over the A squared. And the, okay, so 
don't worry, there's, there's no meaning to it. And of course, his head opens up because he really wishes he had a brain. Um, and uh, which we all know that he actually was kind of the smart one. Now, the Tin Man, um, this started with um, pretty, uh, this started with actually a, a large um, a nutcracker, not even a real nutcracker, it was a nutcracker when it's sort of a, a larger, um, very, you know, sort of decorative nutcracker. So it didn't actually work. And so I found one of these, these guys, and of course, you know, added, you know, the little tin, let's see if I can find it, the, the little oil tin on top of his head is his cap, um, lots of metal and lots of little zippers, uh, little zipper poles are adorning his chest, for instance, actually his whole body for that matter. Um, this was kind of fun though, because what this forced me to do was almost approach this like a mosaic. Um, so I did change things out, like I changed the hands out and changed, you know, but um, a lot of this process was really um, kind of like working with mosaics. So like both in both cases, the hands are totally different. I think that was just a, a model hand and that's a, a set of pliers on the, on the right hand side. Um, but it was, uh, it was fun to do. And this really was, um, this guy was really the thing that got me thinking about the robots. Um, I started saying, oh, you know, a robot class would be kind of a fun variation of that. So when, when COVID hit, um, I had a lot of studio time. <laughs> you know, and I was like, well, okay, I can't go anywhere. And I was so used to being gone, you know, two to three months out of the year um, in general. And all of a sudden I was going nowhere. Um, so I decided, you know, let's, let's take a look at um, COVID as a concept. And so this was the first COVID piece that I did. Um, and this was, you know, some basic uh, head thing. You get it like... TJ Maxx or at, um, um, you know, any sort of second handy store type thing, some, some, some cheap little resin thing. Um, but uh, then I, I decided to turn it into sort of uh, the sort of uh, using the idea of a mask, but mostly what was intriguing to me about COVID at the time, I don't know if you guys remember when, when the whole COVID thing happened, every single, every single graphic you saw was that weird, red and blue thing that was like this weird alien thing that had these little bulbs on it, right? And I was just fascinated by that color scheme and the little bulby things that I kept seeing visually. And I'm like, wow, that is such a, that's such a strong um, recognizable concept, at least at that time. Um, and so I decided to you know, to do a piece with, with those, with that color scheme in mind. And so, uh, so of course got little people. And so I made this little, this little, this little creature here. And then the next one, I believe was, I think it was this one was the next one I did. Um, and, you know, same concept, trying to maintain, um, the, uh, the color scheme. Um, you know, I just that I found that color scheme to be really pretty fascinating, though. I mean, it was mostly because it was a color combination I'd never used before. And so, um, like I was talking about the tarot deck, having you know, forced me into working a certain way, um, this also forced me to work in a certain way, forced me to, to use colors I wouldn't expect to use. Um, and uh, that was that was pretty that was pretty exciting. I'll give a side view of that one there. And then of course there's this guy, um, same dude. This is one of my favorite ones, I have to say. Um, I'd have the I'd have this old, and it's not a genuine radio. It's one of those radios that I, I think they played DVDs or something. You know, it's one of those replica things that had the you know, uh, or maybe it's just a, I I th actually think it did play DV DVDs is what it did. But anyway, so it was um, same idea, um, but playing with the little turning the head into the coronavirus um, red and red and blue uh, side view. And then of course this one, same idea, except this one I decided to play with the idea of distancing because this one was made right when the whole uh, 
you know, having the space between people became sort of an issue. That's when this one was created. All of a sudden there was the, the recommended distance between people. And I had these, these were a couple of characters that I had from a um, ornamental, uh, like a Christmas ornament set or not ornament, but decoration set uh, from um, the, um, oh, I'm trying to remember which, if it was, I, I think this, I think this is one of the three ghosts um, from A Christmas Carol. And this is one of the other characters. I think this is the ghost of Christmas past or Marley. That might be Marley on the right-hand side. Um, and I think that's Fezziwig on the left-hand side. So anyway, I had, I, had these, I had these characters which couldn't really figure out anything to do with. And of course, added the mask and added the little megaphone type thing. And of course, the little hand reaching up, keeping everybody separate. And let's see what else we have here. Let's see, let's go to, let's go through a little process here. So I thought I'd show you guys to give you guys some, some ideas of how these things sort of start. Um, so this piece is actually, doesn't look like this anymore, but this piece is actually in Penticton right now. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, started with a very well busted frame, in fact. Um, I think it was a mirror at one point and a, and we've got, of course, our mannequin heads, which I have plenty laying around and which then evolved into something like that. Sorry about the size. Um, started getting adorned, you know, sort of the little, little viewfindery type thing uh, where you'd have the two little images back in the olden days um, and filling it up a little bit with, with structural stuff. And then eventually, uh, sorry about that. I thought I had bigger photos that you guys, but um, so that is that is a uh, uh, Tonantzin who is the basically she is the um, Mesoamerican version of of um, the uh, Virgin Mary, and in in fact she is who Guadalupe, um, who is the Virgin Mary. But that is the Virgin Mary in that representation. So basically one of the, it's one of the ways that as the story goes, it's the, when Guadalupe appeared on top of mountain in Mexico city, she showed up as Tonantzin. And, it, you know, a lot of people, you know, say it was a way of luring the, the indigenous people to um, Catholicism, other than the brutal ways that they were doing it prior, um, they decided to try a different method um, of doing it. And so that was, that was one of the, that was one of the methods they do is using Tonantzin, who is the mother, basically the mother goddess as Aztec, but also there's of course Mayan variation of that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then some of these are a little bit smaller than I was hoping. Um, this is uh, this one is another Aztec deity, um, Mesoamerican deity, because as I said, there's a variation of this. This started with another weirdo frame that, or a couple of different frames that I found at I think it was like I, I think it was at Home Sense I found these frames at. Um, always in the clearance section, always in the clearance section because they're always busted and nobody wants them and they're usually pretty cheap. Um, and turned into Quetzalcoatl. Um, <clears throat> the plume, AKA the plumed serpent, um, which um, is really the, is really the, um, I think the ultimate icon. I mean, some would say Guadalupe, but I think in terms of indigenous Mexico, I think um, Quetzalcoatl is really the, the, the icon for Mexico. Um, the, it's basically a, a sort of a snake with feathers often is how it's seen, um, how he's seen, but he's also the deity who um, is, is blamed for um, allowing Cortez to take over Mexico because as legend has it, Quetzalcoatl was the one who left and was said to be coming back. And as the story goes, you know, Montezuma um, thought that Cortez was Quetzalcoatl. A lot of that's been debunked. Um, a lot of people have said that, no, that wasn't the case. The Spanish were saying that to make the indigenous Mexicans look stupid. It's like, oh, look at these superstitious people. They think that Cortez is, okay. So a lot of that's been then somewhat debunked. But um, anyway, it said that Quetzalcoatl left to go to the, the netherworld and come back um, in return at some point. Um, so as I said, as, as legend has it, it, it was uh, what led to 
uh, Montezuma submitting to Cortes. But as I said, most of that has been falsified. Um, here's another small photo, giant snakes. These are big ass snakes. Um, these, I, uh, I wanted to, this was one, I wanted to do a Vishnu piece. Vishnu is like one of my favorite deities. Um, Vishnu is the sleeping god um, in um, Hindu legend and lore and religion. And um, the, the, the idea that Vishnu dreams everything that we exist through. So the whole universe is, is dreamt. Uh, we are all part of Vishnu's dream. And Vishnu sleeps behind a giant cobra, you know, sort of like a cobra um, covering, sort of a cobra parasol of sorts. And so when I was making this, I'm like, where the hell I'm going to find a friggin' bunch of cobras? And so I was thinking, man, I'm going to, I'm screwed because, you know, I'm going to make a, what, a whole bunch of little, little plastic snakes or whatever. So <coughs> by chance, I was at like a home sense or something like that. And I came across one snake. And by chance, there happened to be one more. One snake wouldn't have cut it, but two, two really managed to, to, uh, to, do, the, to do the picture. So that's, that's, how it, that's how it all turned out. So um, and what was nice about it, I didn't need the multitude of snakes because I would just because I had to cut the snakes because they were identical. So what I had to do is I had to cut them so they looked like they sort of matched. Um, so I had to cut the head of the one on the right and angle it in a different way. But um, what I found was since it sort of serpentined so much, um, it really gave the impression of a lot of snakes. So I didn't need the whole entire fan and that, that worked out really, really well. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that's good old Vishnu. And um, this is um, also a Hindu deity. His uh, translation for, translation for his name, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce, um, is basically the um, obsidian mirror, <coughs> which is, he's kind of the god of the underworld. That's a very loose, simplistic way of viewing him, but he's uh, definitely, um, he's a shady character, um, and um, definitely, he's a savior of the world, but also a shady character. He is a lot of ways similar to Hades, good guy, bad guy type of thing. So if you think of Hades or Pluto in Greek mythology, very similar. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of my faves um, in mythology and in mythology and in artwork, um, uh, this is one of my favorite pieces. Um, this is Persephone. So in Speaking of Hades, in Greek mythology, Persephone um, gets abducted by Hades and is brought down to the underworld um, against her will. And up on, you know, up, up on uh, planet Earth, um, her mother crying, where's my daughter? Ah, you know, her mother is in charge of springtime and pretty things in summer and plants and all that stuff. And then, um, so when her daughter was away, the, everything turned to ice and snow. And then when she came back, everything turned nice and pretty. So this is Persephone, who um, is really, a, she, Persephone ended up, according to legend, you know, kind of getting into her role as queen of the underworld eventually. Um, but she's, she is a, a dual, sort of a dual character. <coughs> now, a variation of that, sort of Persephone um, <clears throat> made younger um, is that um, this would be like a, a younger version of Persephone, but the idea of the duality, Hades on this side or mother on the other side. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is a different iteration. This, by the way, is built on a giant um, uh, cutting board. So the sucker is heavy. So, and let's see what else we have here. Oh, here's one also in, hanging out in Penticton. This is uh, Zeus. Um, and those of you who know your Greek mythology know that Athena gave him a big headache because she was born out of his head. He kept having these really bad migraines, I guess the worst migraines ever. And lo and behold, Athena popped out 
and um, and uh, gave him grief in different ways. But um, she's really she's probably the strongest female deity, I think, in Greek mythology. I think without argument. I think she's by far the um, I think the strongest the strongest counterpoint. You know, Zeus being the strong guy, but but Athena, his daughter, is definitely um, has as much sway power wise in a lot of ways. So um let's go to let's go to this one this one this is an unfinished piece at this point <coughs> this is also the finished version of this is in um penticton and uh this uh this is how it all started i it starts with you know one of those little owl those little those little birdie scarer awayers right and you got to do something with those birdie scarer wares. And this was really gross because it had like, I don't know, just a bunch of weird little things inside of it, you know, spider webs and, you know, probably rat droppings and things like that when I picked it up in a secondhand store. And, but lopped off its head, found a spice rack, of course. What else do you do with a spice rack? Needed a collar, so a little spice rack. And then lo and behold, we have Lilith. Um, now Lilith, remember we talked about Lilith earlier and Lilith, of course, um, often incorrectly, she's depicted as in, in when people, if you do a search on Google for Lilith, one of the images that will show up <clears throat> is not Lilith, uh, but it's often confused to be Lilith, but it's a woman with sort of a bird body sort of an owl looking body. That's, that's not actually Lilith. It's a, that's a, I believe a Babylonian or a Syrian um, goddess. It is not Lilith, but it was often been, um, often been considered to be Lilith because Lilith is said to have sprouted ring, wings and headed to the Red Sea, as, as I'd mentioned. Anyway, I, I still use that as a, as a source for this just because it is such an iconic, um, an iconic image of her that most people associate with her, um, the big stone relief. Um, that's uh, that that people think of, but yeah, this is Lilith, um, and I just want to show you how much that transforms. You know, and it's really the magic of paint that does everything. You know, because I I know there are purists out there who um, <clears throat> they're purist assemblage artists. Um, who like, oh, I'm never going to add paint to my stuff. And I think that's fine. That's certainly not what the, that's not what assemblage really is. What I actually do is it, technically speaking, these are called combines. Um, a combine is when you put a bunch of stuff together and you add paint to it. Rauschenberg would be an example of that. Um, so you have a bunch of stuff, paint unifies. It. Technical term is not assemblage, it's combines. Combine is kind of a lame word. I don't, it's like, bleh, it's, it's assemblage. It's a much better word. So I've decided this is assemblage. Screw the combine, so. <clears throat> Here's another piece uh, in Penticton. Um, Bethany is gonna go after, she, over the, after this is over, she's gonna go run in the gallery and, and compare things now. Um, but, um, <clears throat> One of the one of the um, images I use a lot is the Hamsa, uh, depending on the culture, Hamsa or Aya Fatima, hand of protection. Um, it's the the idea of a, the the eye with or the eye in the middle of a, the palm of the hand. Um, very common in a lot of cultures, um, and uh, in Judaism, you know, obviously it's the Hamsa, uh, but uh, usually is a way of warding off evil things. In fact often used to ward off Lilith, because uh, Lilith, who is out to get anything that's related to Eve, which would be like children, for instance, um, pregnant women, um, you might need a hamsa to um, ward off Lilith. And over the, often over the cribs of babies, um, you might actually, in a, in a Jewish household, you might actually find a hamsa. So, sorry, the photos are a little bit small. Now, <clears throat> I love Baron Munchausen, Baron Munchausen. Um, Baron Munchausen was a dude, uh, a character from, oh, I don't know, 1700s, I think, 
1600s, perhaps, I think 1700s, but it was a, sort of a fanciful character. You know, he was the guy who did everything, you know, lolly, lollipop trees. And remember there was one story about Baron Munchausen that I read where he was being attacked by a bear <clears throat> and the way the bear swallowed his arm, or I think, and I think he had a pistol in his arm. Bear swallowed his hand with the pistol and he let go of the pistol and reached inside the bear and pulled the bear inside out. So he had these, you know, his stories were just, you know, crazy fantastical. So one of the stories that Baron Munchausen has of his being swallowed by um, a sea creature. And so I decided I'd do a, a, a version of that. And uh, so, oh, small, sorry, you guys. Uh, so here is, you have to look close to your screen. Um, here is uh, Baron Munchausen hanging out and he's got a little bird in his hand, which you can't see, but um, he's hanging out inside a sea monster's mouth as his ship is up above. But yeah, the whole Pinocchio thing um, kind of comes from Baron Munchausen, which comes from the whole Jonah and the whale thing. So all that stuff, that's the kind of the cool thing about these mythologies is they all sort of jump in to each other. This is a fairly recent piece. Um, this, I did this a uh, couple months back <clears throat> and this really started, uh, I, I wasn't really entirely sure where this piece was going to go um, initially. Um, I knew I, I'd had this hand, this, this, it's not a plaster hand, it's like a, uh, I don't even know what it's made, it's wooden, I think, or, or sort of compressed wood. But I had this hand in my studio for years, years and years. I had purchased it at Salamagundi, which many of you probably know if you've been to Vancouver, which used to be the greatest antique store in the world, but shut down about three or four years ago. But I needed, I decided I needed to do something with it after all these years, because it was such a cool hand. Um, so then I said, I did that and I said, well, I'll put something in there. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do and um, thematically, but then I started, <clears throat> I, I had heard about a, a story, a true story about a slave ship, um, the Zong, uh, that uh, was a Dutch slave ship that uh, had, I don't remember how many slaves on it. It, and it, uh, came to it it got it was filled with sickness everybody was dying on it the crew was dying the slaves were dying and the crew decided the captain decided to throw the slaves overboard and this is men women and children overboard and i think they end up throwing over 100 180 150 <clears throat> people overboard and the reason was was because they um, if they rolled ashore with a bunch of sick slaves, they wouldn't get the insurance money. So their justification was they'd get rid of they'd get rid of the slaves and then they could collect the insurance money. You know, obviously a horrific thing. So at the same time, I was reading the story about the um, about a siren in this this region, um, a mermaidish creature um, that was renowned for saving um, those people who fall into the sea. And as the story goes, and right now I'm off the top of my head, I can't remember, I can't remember her name, um, but it's a very definitive deity in this region. <clears throat> and um, the idea is that, you know, a sailor would fall in or a person would fall in and then she would put them inside a pr protective bubble beneath the sea for a while and they would come out of the, out of the water um, and would essentially, you know, be more enlightened from that experience. And so I decided to take this really tragic tale and put a slightly more positive spin on it, a, sort of a what if type of thing. You know, if the slaves that were thrown overboard um, were actually fortunate enough to have the protective help of the, the siren from the deep. Um, and I, you know, I, which, um, Maybe it happened. I, I don't. I don't know. But it, it, it certainly would be a hopeful. It would be a hopeful thought if that were the case. Um, so that is La Serena. Um, let's move to some of the new things I've been doing. I've been working on masks, and the masks have been a lot of fun. A lot of fun to do. And we'll go to this one. Uh, <clears throat> so the last bunch of photos I'm going to show you are the the new ones that I've been working on. 
Um, and I, I have a collection, I, I have a big collection of masks at, at, in my home that I, I pretty much whenever I go somewhere, I try and bring back a mask from that place. Um, I have a ton of masks from Mexico, mostly because you know I go there quite a bit, but I really have a lot of masks from lots of different places. And I try and get masks only when I'm at a place that has the mask. So in other words, I'm probably not gonna buy an, a, a mask from India um, if I, if I don't go to India, you know? So I, I try and reserve it for when I go to that place. It also inspires me to go to those places. So um, this started as sort of like a clock top, the top of a, a clock. So the top of it, you can see the, it was a, a large wall clock. And then I decided I would sort of create a, a creature out of that. Um, a, and it reminded me of um, Borong, which is a, I have a mask that I got in Bali and Barong is a character that you often see guarding um, entryways to homes in Bali. You also uh, will see Barong statues on bridges to protect the bridges, but um, it, he's sort of a guard. He's a very intimidating looking, but he's definitely sort of a character that, that is intimidating to ward off evil things. So that's what, that's what this piece symbolizes. Um, Barong, but called the Guardian. <clears throat> this piece, um, this, okay, so this piece, just so you know, um, if you swivel this upside down, um, where his chin is would be the neck of a mannequin um, torso type thing. So where his eyebrows are would be sort of the base. You know, those mannequins that sort of sit with the bust down. I had a, I was using, I use the face of a mannequin thing like this and I had the body laying around. I go, well, I can make a mask out of that. So I did sort of a, uh, it reminded me of a Don Quixote mask that I came across in, uh, that I have from um, uh, Guanajuato. Guanajuato in Mexico, outside of Mexico City, close to San Miguel de Allende, has a, a big Cervantes festival. And so I have a mask that I picked up while I was there of Don Quixote. And um, I sort of made this sort of in honor of the mask I already own. So this is, this is, my, this is my man from La Mancha mask. This is weather worn Bjorn. Um, I had a lantern, like a wooden lantern that I cut in half. And the only part of this piece that is wood is actually sort of the, the lantern parts, sort of the, the stuff that you see on the top of his head and sort of like right, right beside his nose and you know the sort of the outline of his face. The, the mouth and the nose and the, a lot of this is actually not wood. Um, that was the challenge with this piece is to try and match the, um, to make the whole piece look like it was wood. And so I, I'd never really done that before. I'd done, I've used a lot of texture but never really tried to emulate wood. So, I mean, very, I tried to make it very genuine looking. So that was really a fun challenge to try and do that with with old weather-worn Bjorn. And then the last one was the one I just finished. This is my, my um, homage to Larry Talbot. Larry Talbot, of course, those of you who are horror movie aficionados, um, Larry Talbot is uh, the wolf man. Um, he's the guy who turns into the wolf in the movie, The Wolfman, Lon Chaney Jr. Um, and uh, so thus I, I, I decided I would, I wasn't sure that was gonna be the case with this, but I, I did, I started, the whole piece started with a um, coat of arms. A, it was kind of a plastic coat of arms thing and a saw blade handle, which is the mouth. And I, uh, I had those two things and uh, I go, well, okay, that, that'll make a good mouth. And then what I'm gonna do. And then I had, you know, sort of clock parts laying around which became the eyebrows and the top of the coat of arms thing, which sort of became the ears. Um, and so of course I had an existing little portion of it that had the little scroll that was built into the little plastic coat of armsy thing that, it, that I started from, which I have no idea what that was actually used for. Um, and then the little tiny, tiny coat of arms. And so I created a new Talbot coat of arms of the full moon in the background. Now, one of the things you can see are the remnants like below his eyes or like coming almost like tears are sort of scrolls or things um, or sort of decorative stuff that came with the original base. And one of the, the 
the things that worked out that led me to turn this into a werewolf was the fact that the texture on the, um, on the actual um, plastic coat of arms was this weird sort of, it, it was supposed to be wood, but it looked more like fur. And so I go, okay, well, it's fur. So therefore it must be a werewolf. So, and then of course the eyes are painted. I've been, lately I've been using less um, glass eyes, things like that. And I've been spending more time painting. I've been having a lot, a lot of fun painting eyes as of late, so. All right, so that, that is the goods, you guys. I'm gonna stop the share and come back on. And here I am. So um, now what we can do is we can do a little Q&A stuff. And um, uh, Bethany, you can pop back in and see how you wanna, Hello. how you wanna, how are you? That was amazing, thank you. What an incredible journey, oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, we've got a couple questions from folks that have visited the gallery. So maybe we'll start from there and then we can uh, pop back into folks that are here. Um, so one of the questions was, uh, with more mass production, are you finding it harder to find unique things to add to your sculptures? Um, yes and no. In, in some ways, mass production helps <clears throat> because, um, what you can find are, you, you still get stuff. And, and the way I work anyway, is I get, I, I use things that, uh, I use parts of things and seldom do I use an entire thing. So if I, if I find something in a secondhand store that's, you know, for instance, if you think about the snakes, right, those are mass produced wherever, um, but I'm using them in, I'm not using them as the sole thing. They're a component of something else. So uh, yes and no. The one problem I found with the old stuff, and this is true, like, especially when you, you know, go to Mexico, what the, I, and this probably might relate more to what the question is really about. Um, I find that it is, it is hard to find affordable, um, junk. So like that, that wooden, that wooden box that Lilith was made out of, um, I don't know. I probably spent 150 to 200 bucks on the box alone, right? Let alone the shipping of that box. And <clears throat> now that was 10, 12 years ago. Uh, so who knows what that would be, you know, now. And that, that is really sort of the problem. And I, <clears throat> I know also, depending on where you go, like for instance, Vancouver area, um, the age of the place will make things harder to come across. So Vancouver and the areas around Vancouver aren't really old compared to if you go to um, North Carolina, for instance. You know, North Carolina antiques are, I, I remember finding an entire wall shrine and it came out of a church, huge. I mean, it was the type of thing that, you know, that, that was, it was giganto. And I couldn't logistically, and it was not very expensive, like 800 bucks for this giant, crazy wall shrine thing, altar type thing. But I couldn't, it would, it would have cost me three times as much to get it home as it would, you know, so it's that, it's that whole thing. So where you go will make a big difference. Mexico is not a place to buy antiques. Everything's reused um, over and over and over again. And so everybody thinks Mexico is going to be filled with stuff, but it's really hard to find cheap stuff there because it's used, so. Thank you. And I've got one other question um, that somebody emailed to us. Uh, will you do more of your podcast, Strange Tales of Myth and Magic, because they're mything you? Uh, yes, I know. <laughs> I, haven't, <clears throat> I haven't done any new ones since I think last year. I think that December is the last one. But yeah, I do. I have been thinking about that lately. And I really want to start it up again. The, the biggest thing was I was finding it to be so time consuming. I wasn't getting as much studio work in. So what I might do is I might start trying to get that up and going again. Um, but I probably won't, won't do it. I think I was trying to do it like um, bi-monthly initially or, or whatever. I'm going to try and do it, but it might not be popping up as frequently as it was before. So maybe every month, maybe every two months, but I really, I really do miss doing it. It was a lot of fun. Mostly it was really fun to, to force myself to research all that stuff because it forced me to, you know, cause a lot of times you're like, ah, I you scroll through stuff, but this actually, I, you know, I had to have all my, all my uh, facts correct you know, as opposed to a quick Wikipedia look. Oh, okay, what's that? So I actually had to make sure that what I was saying was 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 accurate. So um, 
So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I will probably be doing some very soon. So those are tons of fun. I know people really enjoy them. And so did anybody on the, the podcast, the podcast, anybody on the zoom today have any questions? It's going to put you in gallery mode real quick so I can try and see everybody at one time. I'll just pin Michael here. There we go. Does it look if there, anybody has any questions? Does anybody have anything you wanted to say to Michael? You can unmute yourself. Oh, here's Paula. I'm Paula. Hi. Hi, Paula. I'm really in, hi. I'm really enjoying the wood texture, um, faux wood textures you're doing. That's that's very um, a nice nice new sort of fresh touch for your new things. Yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun doing, and I think that um, I, I I was thinking about this the other day. In fact, because I know Paula, you've done a lot of online classes. That it would be it would be fun to try and come up with a project that really focused a lot on that because that's an angle that I haven't really explored in the online class stuff. I mean, sort of dance over it a little bit, but there's a just even painting, but also the text. You know, there's ways to paint it that way. There's also a way to do it, but so I think I'm going to try and come up with something that that feeds into that because I think it would be a fun, you know, fun project to come up with. It's woodishly woodishly in, inclined. So yeah, because I, I appreciate the the color and the assemblage uh, rather than combine, and um, yeah. I think color um, adds the awesome to assemblage. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, it is. It is funny. I I I. But a lot of that is because I started as a painter, though. So you know, I mean, mm -hmm. for me, I couldn't, I couldn't not do it anyway. You know, I couldn't yeah. stick a hammer to a thing, and you know, it would just yeah, it, would, it just has that much more depth and and interest. I just, I'm just really, I love, I love texture, and and this new technique is really working. Thanks, Paula. That's yeah, uh, that's yeah. Nice of you to say. Welcome. And we've got a question from um, the chat. Michaela's wondering, what's your favorite piece in the Penticton show? Hmm. My favorite piece. I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember all the pieces. You know, the the hardest thing is like a lot of times I always think of my, I always think of my most recent my most recent stuff as my favorite stuff. You know, because I always figure like the new stuff is well it's it's better because i just did it you know i had all the other stuff so i have to say i like the masks quite a bit but i um trying to think uh going through going through the exhibit i there i'm i have to say i am a since i'm a since i'm a big fan of uh you know the lilith character i really like the owl piece that's in that show i um and <clears throat> mostly because you know i on, honestly there's not perhaps as much assemblage with that. There's maybe three or four different parts to it. Um, but it's, um, I don't know. I just really liked how that turned out. I think it evoked a lot of what I was trying to say color-wise. Um, and so I, you know, I even kind of gave her Gene Simmons makeup, you know. <laughs> I was a Gene Simmons freak when I was like in junior high. So, you know, of course, what junior high boy wasn't, right? It's a beautiful piece. And just so uh, folks that are um, on the call know as well, it is still available. So you can connect with us if you're interested. Got to put the plug in. Um, Roger, you're unmuted. Did you have a question for Michael? Oh, yeah. I was just trying to set it up as a chat and I was kind of blowing it. My question was, uh, has the COVID uh, shutting you down traveling in workshops uh, and giving you more studio time, has it had effects on your work? And I, I miss your, uh, I miss your dark, your dark, uh, broody, early day pieces. I, <laughs> I, I like the colors, interesting, but boy, your old stuff just knocks me out. Well, you know, it's funny because, well, to go to go to the uh, to go to your first part of the question, um, <clears throat> the I would say that, co yeah, there's a lot more studio time. But because of COVID, it also shut me down in terms of traveling for a good year and a half, right? And to some degree, moving into next year will be more challenging. But um, the 
the the thing I would say is that it it what I what I made up for travel I started doing more online classes so I started finding I had less time because I was making you know doing more online to make up for the money I was losing traveling so so yes and no um, in terms of my dark brooding sensibility that that yeah because Roger's taken a lot of classes for me over the years um, from from way back and. You know, it's funny, I find myself, if I, I was uh, looking through some really old, I was looking through some really old slides, slides to give you an idea how old, back when you used to take slides of your work. Um, and, you know, believe it or not, Roger, my earliest, the stuff I was doing before the stuff that you're referring to was actually almost as colorful as the stuff I'm doing now. So it was kind of an interesting, um, it was interesting because seeing how I went from there and then to there, and then I always look at art as being sort of a, you, you never know where you're going to land, right? And so I think depending on what you're trying to say, I think one of the reason I, one of the reasons I, I think I've, I've been doing a lot more color um, has to do with the fact that, you know, a lot of people like to read into it. Oh, it's, you have such a, you must, it must be a relationship with Andrea because she is so colorful and, you know, she has, you uses so much color in her, in her work and, and you're much happier now. And I don't know that that's, I don't know that it has to do with happiness because I, you know, my stuff always sits on a darker plane anyway, no matter what. So I don't know that that's it. I think it has to do with novelty of, of, of what you come across. So for instance, like recently I, I started playing with chroma paints and they had some interesting colors that I hadn't really used. I said, I'm gonna start using opaque colors. And then they had cabdium chartreuse. And I'm like, I'm going to start using that. So I think there's a there's a certain novelty that happens. So don't get too distraught. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I, there, there's always the, 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 possi the possibility and also the probability that, um, that I'll drift back into some darker tones for the years. It's, it's going to, there's always going to be this ebb and flow of, of, uh, of work as, as you move forward. So don't, don't fret. There's, 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 There'll be darker things on the horizon. <laughs> good, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> and um, Leslie from the chat asks, "How do you sell most of your work?" Um. Well, these days, I, I've never, I've never been a huge I, like. I have work in in New Orleans, right? So, I, and I do sell work. Um, consistently through there and I've had galleries throughout the years it's it's always been sort of a that's always been sort of a, a trickle though it's like you know something sells and something else sells over there and so um, I've always been the most successful selling um, online I mean frankly that's always been where I've been the most successful now for pragmatics obviously the stuff that sells most readily is small stuff and that's because of affordability and so that's why you know like I'll have my annual Krampus sale, the little ornament things, uh, you know, do all that stuff. So, um, and that stuff really, the small stuff is really sort of bread and butter in terms of that, because it's, you know, people can say, okay, I can drop a couple hundred bucks versus a couple thousand bucks, right? You know, it's a lot easier for that, um, in my case, for, for people to do that, especially with my, my clientele, my, my following. Um, so I always I always set up a number of you know sales that are sort of within a certain price range that that are affordable um, by and large. Now large stuff is the same thing though. Large stuff is usually um, it, it's, people contact me and I sell it very seldom on my website. Uh, I usually it's the type of thing where I'll I'll post something and people will see it and are interested. Fair amount of commissions. That's the other thing that that happens. Um, you know, people will see something and uh, they, they'll ask about it, and especially if it's sold already. One of, my, one of the things I often do, and it's a, it's a way of selling things, but I'll say, hey, look, I know that was sold. Would you like me to, to explore doing something more personalized with you? And it's a way of, of approaching a client that way. Um, you know, and a lot of people are, you know, I, a lot of people are, are usually intrigued by that, to think of like something being personalized. I know a lot of artists don't like to do that um, because it's uh, can be very stressful, which it is. Com commissions are are very very stressful things to do because you're, you know, you're like trying to do something, trying to to think of something that somebody else might want, but at the same time, be true to yourself, right? So, 
um, trying to balance those things is very difficult. That said, in my case, I can say that I would say that my most successful pieces um, by and large have been commissions, not all of them, but I'd say some of my most, most successful pieces have been things that I've been done for people specifically because I have to put almost that extra level into it. Um, you know, I have to do that extra level of research. Um, and I also have to add the thing and like, don't screw this sucker up. You know, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, whereas, you know, you do something and go, oh, I think I'm done with it. You know, like, eh, I don't know, am I done with it? You know, the other thing with commissions, you know, of course you always have to, you're, you're going to have to throw it past the person at some point anyway, you're going to say, do you like it? You know, and you're not going to charge somebody if they, you know, you know, if they say, no, that sucks. But so far that hasn't happened. So I'm, I'm, I'm relieved that, you know, spend a, two weeks making something and they, they say, ah, that sucks. Never mind. So. I could never imagine somebody saying that to you. <laughs> I imagine well, that everybody okay. absolutely loves everything that you make. So. Well, you know what though, you know, it's weird. I've done some, I've done some interesting, th this is a good example though, is like, some in instances where I would do a trade with some an artist that I know or a friend. And I used to, I used to do a lot of trades with artists and that, you know, get a, you know, you get a really nice collection of art that way. And uh, the, um, the thing that would happen is I sort of learned my lesson is like, I, I found that by a lot of times it would happen, they'd approach me and say, oh, I really like that work. And I'd say, well, let's do a trade. And they go, oh, I'll make you something. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, there have been, I'd say about half the time that that's happened where what I got wasn't exactly representative of what they do. And it's sort of like, eh, they do so much better stuff. What, you know, and I, I, I was just, you know, and, I, and so I found that like with trades in particular, um, it's, they may not have the same attitude about creating like a commission that I do, but I found that like, I'll, if they have something I like, I'll say, I want that, you know, because otherwise it's, because you don't want, you don't want to end up with like, oh, okay, that's totally not good. Okay. So now that it's not good, it's not what you were hoping for, I think would be a better way to put it. So, yeah. So. Well, just to wrap up um, and thank you everybody for coming today, but Michael, why don't you let uh, everybody know what you've got uh, up on the horizon? You've got a new workshop. And then of course you have the very exciting sale coming up later as well. Yep. Um, the Krampus good brush has gone bad. That starts up November 11th class starts. So the online class where we're taking brushes and we're making them into um, Krampus ornaments. Those of you who want to, um, I guess you would untreat your friends with those, um, give them as anti-gifts, I guess, um, or to balance out your tree, make your, you know, so you don't, you don't want your tree to be overly goody two shoes. So we're going to do, we're going to be doing that in November early bird discount ends tomorrow. So if you haven't signed up, make sure you sign up by tomorrow um, to get, save about 20 bucks off the, the, the price. And then of course, in mid-November, I have my special Krampus sale, which is different. Um, I'm really excited about this. The new Krampuses, I'll give you guys a little heads up. You won't really know what I'm, won't really get the entirety of what's going to be showing up. But the ornaments this year that I'm selling are two-faced. Um, <clears throat> they're bratty kid on one side, Krampus on the front side, but there's a moving part. So that's kind of fun. So I've got some, I've got some um, fun little Krampus bratty kid ornaments that will be going on sale um, starting mid-November so that there'll be time to ship them out before Christmas. So, so yep. So that's, that's on the horizon. And I should mention, if anybody wants to go to Italy, um, looks like all systems are go. Um, so anybody who wants to hang out with me and Andrea in Italy, um, we'll be heading to Orvieto, Italy um, to make some art. So that'll be happening in May. So if you're bored, got nothing to do. So. Well, that is so exciting. Oh my goodness. Lucky people who get to go on that trip and to your one that's coming up right now to Oaxaca. Yep. And you're leaving yep. on just a few days, I believe. Yeah. Leaving on, on Thursday night at 11 PM. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, can't wait to see what's created from that. So very yeah, exciting yeah. stuff. And if everybody wants to reach you, your website? www.michaeldemeng.com. That's www.michaeldemeng.com. <laughs> and if you want to see uh, Mythologizing the Mundane, you can catch it on our website, penticktonartscouncil.com. Um, it'll be, uh, even after the exhibition is over, we'll still leave it up. And we're doing, a, we're working on maybe keeping some of Michael's um, art here available for sale a little bit longer past the exhibition as well, too. So you can reach out to myself or Serene at the office if you're interested in purchasing anything. Um, and once again, thank you everybody for attending today. And thank you so much, Michael. We really appreciated your time. And, you know, this was such a fabulous artist talk. So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Bethany. It's been a lot of fun exhibiting. And I'm, I see all these faces that I'm going to know I'm going to see very, very soon, either in person or online. So it's great to see all you guys. So thanks for coming and listening to me blather on. <laughs> It's a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. I'd love to hear you laugh. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you, guys. Thank you.